Hello everybody and welcome to How to Blockchain. Today we're going to cover how to write a book about blockchain and I'm here with Keir Fenlo Bates. I'm sure many of you know him already from his vlogs, from his LinkedIn posts and from being pretty eminent within the blockchain community but for those who don't know Keir please give us an intro. So hi I'm Keir Fenlo Bates. I'm a blockchain researcher, a blockchain inventor and an all-round blockchain enthusiast and uh, I'm very pleased to be here Anthony. Thanks very much for coming on, Keir. Now, from my rough count, there are roughly a million blockchain books out there at the moment. Everybody seems to have written one. What is it that got you to write one more? Well, there's two parts to that question, actually. So the first one is, why would you write a book? And it is a bit of a masochistic pastime. It's not fun for 95% of the time, but the other 5% make up for it. Um, as for why to write a blockchain book when there are so many out there, I think that boiled down to the fact that when I started a year ago, uh, all the books that I'd seen fell into pretty much one of two categories. You had the, the ones that were basically reference manuals for developers, and they have their place and they can be very valuable. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you had the, the business development, uh, futurist thought leader kind of stuff, which, as far as I can tell, are aimed at CEOs on a transatlantic flight who can't convince themselves to read a novel, but they don't want to look at sales figures and uh, the strategic plan for the next five years. So they read one of those books and then when they get off the flight, they feel like they've done some work. Um, and I wanted to write something that didn't fall in either of those two categories. So that's what I started and that's what I've done. Very good. So do tell us, what's the book called? Well, the book is called Move Over Brokers, Here Comes the Blockchain. And there you go. I don't know if you can see that. I can, oh. with a nicely positioned strawberry with a razor blade stuck through it. And that's right. Yes. You've got to have a good striking image on a cover. It can't just be something feeble. So Clearly. And what's different about your book that is different to everyone else's out there? What are the things that you're most proud of? Um, so what I've tried to do is make something that can appeal and educate uh, everybody. So it was quite an ambitious approach. You know, when they say, what's your target audience? And you say, everyone. Um, okay, maybe not children. Um, but uh, I think there's something there for everyone. And I've spent two or three years now walking around the Finnish forests trying to explain pretty complicated blockchain concepts, both technical ones and economic and even philosophical ones, in a simple, understandable way. And with this book, I continue that but I've also tried to make it entertaining so that people will actually get through to the final page. So that's it in a nutshell. So it's a blockchain book for everybody that has mm -hmm. been forged in the finished, for finished forests that people will read all the way through to the end. So I, I feel like there's plenty to work with on that one. And maybe even there are some children out there who might pick it up, who knows. Um, Possible. Let's talk about your process. Because obviously we, we spoke on the podcast a while ago about your process for inventing. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether there's a slightly, you know, there's an analogous examples or synergies between your, your approach for designing blockchain patents versus writing a, a book that's intended for everybody. How do you go about writing a book and what are some of the um, tips or tricks that you would pass on to budding authors out there? Well, for starters, the process developed over time. Uh, the very first thing I did was uh, actually produce an earlier book, which I dashed off in a week. And uh, that was a book about how to use LinkedIn. And that was really partially an experiment to learn a bit about how do you go about doing this? Because the only time I'd written a major work before was my PhD thesis, and that was 25 years ago. And also a thesis is not really a good template for writing a book for public consumption. Uh, so then I started writing this book, uh, about a year ago and I have to admit that it took a while to get my get into my stride um, and then COVID hit and schools closed and I had to take a bit of a break but over the summer and especially the last couple of months I really think I've actually got it nailed down now so I think there's two things really the first one is that uh, don't force yourself to write if you're just not in the mood. What you need to do is you need to get yourself motivated to the point that you uh, actually feel, you can, the words just are kind of flowing out of you. And the second thing is when you feel like that, make sure you keep writing until that feeling stops. And you'll get that feeling more and more the more you write. 
So that's the key one, I think. And then the second one, uh, and this is a trick, is I put the text into a text-to-speech converter. And I put my headphones on and I actually use a voice that sounds a bit like Barack Obama, of all people. And so I listen to Barack Obama uh, reading my book back to me. And that is actually quite incredible because it stops you from reading past the mistakes that you see and reading the intonations and the cadence of the sentences. Uh, your mind will kind of fill in the blanks and write over the mistakes. If you hear another voice read it back to you, then it actually feels like someone's talking to you and you can listen to it more closely. So uh, those would be the two main tips, I think, for writing a book. Got you. And are there any specific kind of learnings that you found around getting into flow? Is it something that, that you can trigger? I mean, is it about dietary choices, about time <laughs> of day? Um, you know, is there, is there a way that you can force flow? Um, it's not easy. It's more about what you do beforehand, I guess. So I like to, uh, I like to write when the kids have gone to bed. Um, so typically uh, after about 10 o'clock. And uh, then I will just keep going till 12, 1, 2, 3, or I might wrap it up in 15 minutes if I'm not feeling it. And I found that it tends to work better on days where I've um, had time to think about what I'm going to write. So I s wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to write about DeFi today, or I'm going to write about self sovereign identity. And then I keep that in the back of my mind. I find myself going to web pages and rereading papers that I've downloaded and stuff, just rather than going to social media. Uh, or watching television and then when I sit down to write it's all there and it, it's kind of similar I guess to the uh, the LinkedIn videos that I make it's the same process there ask the question think about it for a day or two and then go out and do the video on one take very good I, I always appreciate your method and I am pretty much sure I wouldn't have the discipline or the tacit memory these days to be able to retain the information that you do I'm very impressed uh, every time I watch it the amount of sort of sensible and in-depth content you're managed to cram into a short period of time as it they say it's harder to write a short book than it is to write a long one i'm pretty sure yeah. the same same is true of, of having a short vlog versus a very long ramble in the woods yeah. what did you find were some of the harder topics to write from an entertaining perspective or from from a a comprehensive perspective you know, when you were listening to barack play them back to you, you know, what were the ones that you found were, were challenging and you really needed to work hard to get now nailed down I think most of the time it was a matter of actually getting the approach. And once I had that, then it was okay. But uh, the toughest one, the one that just sat around for the longest is called fair gambling. And it's where I'm looking at entropy and randomness and comparing that with the deterministic nature of blockchains and uh, what the importance of randomness uh, and communication theory is in blockchain. So, uh, uh, and I think the reason for that is entropy is a really hard concept for anybody to explain. There's a neat quote from John von Neumann in the book that uh, touches on that. So if you get a copy, you can actually go and read that quote. Well, you have a copy, Anthony, for the rest of the people watching this video. I will. It's it's on a promise, and we have our we have our own special arrangement for what you what you're going to get in in trade. Uh, not Bitcoin, not ETH, uh, and not Doge in this case, very disappointingly, but uh, maybe we can do a re grand reveal when it arrives in Finland at your place. I could well do a LinkedIn video on it, yep. Very good. So, I mean, let's get into it. So we've talked a little bit about the process. Um, mm -hmm. Let's do, maybe pick a, a paragraph or, or part of the book that you think best represents the Kia Finland Bates style of writing about blockchain uh, and mm -hmm. give us all a, a reading, please. Okay, so, so the title of the book is Move Over Brokers, Here Comes the Blockchain. And actually, maybe I should do a little uh, bit of an explanation where the title came from, um, which is, I had this idea for a book where I looked at the nature of the emergence of punk rock music in the 70s and the do-it-yourself ethos. And I started the book by comparing the same ethos that I saw in the cypherpunks and in blockchain. Um, now, I had to change the title because it wasn't initially going to be, never mind the brokers, here comes, uh, here's the blockchain. But uh, the trademark holders uh, to the Sex Pistols album with a very similar name said, no, you can't do that. So now I have a title which has exactly one word in common um, and uh, therefore is not infringing. Um, plus the colors are different and everything. So, uh, and I'll read a passage that basically ties those two together and hopefully it'll make a bit more sense to people. So this section is called The Manufacture of Consensus. Nakamoto decided to tackle the following accountancy problem. 
how to ensure an open public ledger of balances is maintained in a reliable and trustworthy manner with a single view of the truth as to those balances while preserving some level of anonymity. If you reread that sentence, you'll realize that this core problem contains quite a few tricky sub-problems. Unpicking each in turn helps explain the end solution that Nakamoto came up with. For now, I'll summarize but throughout this book, various fundamental aspects of blockchain are examined because ultimately Nakamoto's achievement was to identify the problems hiding beneath the big problem and then finding existing solutions from the worlds of cryptography, computer science, mathematics and networking. And finally, combining them in such a way that the sum of the parts became substantially larger than the individual bits. In other words, trying to explain blockchain is like trying to explain the magic of a band. You need a driving bass line, catchy drum beat the poetry of the lyrics, the power of vocals, some good guitar riffs, and a dash of charisma in the lead singer. But it's the synthesis of all the aforementioned that makes for a classic song with lasting impact. You can't explain it by looking at the individual components in isolation, other than noting that the best bands and the best inventions have all of them in abundance. I love that. And I think that that, that resonates with me sort of out, out and beyond the, the Bitcoin and Satoshi Nakamoto references into how do you actually see the best transformations or the best um, business cases or use cases coming out of the use of a technology. It does require multiple different parties who have different perspectives on uh, a particular use of that technology and working in consort. Um, I like the analogy and, and I know there's a whole bunch more interesting comedic um, yeah, really insightful parts of the book that I've had a pleasure to get a kind of advanced read on and I'm sure the audience are going to enjoy it. In terms of the, the, the next steps, is there going to be an audio book? Are you going to be, you know, is there going to be a Keir Finlow Bates voiced over version? Because while Obama feels like, you know, a potentially interesting narrator for your book, I'm pretty sure the audience are going to enjoy hearing it through your voice. Well, I do have plans for an audio book in the start of next year. Um, first, I'm going to um, issue an ebook after this uh, paperback one and a hardback just to get that out of the way. And then I'm hoping, um, probably in collaboration with a number of people, to produce an audio book in the first quarter of next year. So we'll see how that goes because I've never made one before, but it should be a wonderful learning experience. Keir Finlow Bates' first audio production. I, I'm interested who the band is going to be, who you're going to get together for that one, but I, I can't wait. That sounds really interesting. And, and not being a man who's short of ideas and projects, what's next? Is there going to be a sequel, a prequel, a spin-off series? You know, what are you going to do with this now you've, now you've broken the back of the first, I want to say, feature-length book? You know, somebody asked in a comment, uh, what's the next book going to be after this one? And I think at the time my comment was, in response was, I haven't even finished this one. I don't want to think about that um, because I was at that final sprint to the finish line of the marathon and I was feeling awful. Um, of course, now I've got all the endorphins because it's actually finished. And, uh, you know, there's just a bit of tidying up and then the actual publishing launch on uh, Friday next week. Uh, but when I was writing the final chapter on decentralized finance, um, it just started expanding. And it's one of the longer chapters in the book. And really looking at that, I think it deserves an entire book to itself. I mean, it's a crazy world and it's immensely complicated. Uh, however, all the individual bits, again, are actually rather simple. And once you've just learned to take the steps and you can see your way through, oh, that's what this bit does, that's what this bit does. Suddenly you can look at an article where they say, a hacker drained this contract of this many million tokens using the following things and it actually makes sense so uh if there's another one and it's a big if uh i think it would be DeFi. very good i, I love the marathon analogy there too because it, it kind of hits me in two ways i almost trained for a marathon um my body didn't quite get me through it and uh, that's a longer story for a different day um, but people who run marathons or people who train for marathons do tend to do the first one and then feel compelled to do the next one. Mm. Partly, I suspect, from the enjoyment, but partly also from, you know, the amount of hours of training and fitness and, you know, expense on running shoes and fancy Lycra stuff um, kind of means that they feel compelled to keep going because they put that much energy and effort into it. Why wouldn't they? 
Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested you know, that you're, that you, while the endorphins are still going, you're going on to the next one. Also from a marathon perspective, I love that you're giving the audience the hardest, longest chapter at the end. Um, I hope your book doesn't feel like a marathon to get all the way through, um, but to get them to finish up on DeFi really will show you know, who's prepared to read all the way to the end. And hopefully there are some, uh, some Easter eggs at the very back of the book. So that those who get the, the reward of getting there will probably get a few extra nuggets mm. of Keir Finlow Bates wisdom and humor. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited for it to come out. It's been really fascinating talking to you. Uh, just finally, how can people find out more about the book? When's it coming out? Uh, and what, what more have you got going on in your life? Right, so um, it's got its own website, uh, www.thinklair.com. And that actually has a calendar that's counting down to the launch date. Um, I can't set it exact to the hour because when you post a book on a self-publishing site, then it's up to Amazon to decide when they actually put it live on the site. But from past experience, it should be out on Friday next week. So I think, is that the fifth? It's something like that. Anyway, um, it's a week on Friday, uh, first Friday of December. Uh, and thinklair.com is the place to go. Um, I'll also be talking a bit more about it on LinkedIn. Um, and as for what I'm doing after it's launched, well, I think, I haven't really decided yet. I think I may be talking about some of the chapters on a few posts on LinkedIn and explaining some of the ideas behind them a, a little bit more, or pointing out some nuggets that uh, could get skipped over given the length of the thing. Very good. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the virtual book tour, maybe some virtual readings in a few different settings around the world in different time zones. I'm sure you'll get a number of people who'd be uh, willing to set those sorts of things up for the fans mm. out there. So again, thank you for sharing your wisdom. I hope the, those out there working in and around blockchain who feel they might have a book in them, hopefully this has given you a little bit of insight into what it takes. I'm, I'm more of a podcast and video medium type of guy at the moment. Uh, I'm not one for sitting down and writing reams and reams, but for those out there who can be inspired or who feel that there's a creative component to them that isn't being satisfied, maybe going and writing a blockchain book is the thing that you want to do. Um, if you want to write a book for everybody that touches on everything, that covers all of the history and a little bit of pop music and punk in the meantime, this could be the book for you. Keir Finlow Bates, as ever, it's a pleasure talking to you. Good luck with the book release and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Anthony. It was great to talk to you.